Alaska is a place of wild and diverse beauty. From the forests of southeast to the rolling tundra in the Arctic refuge, Alaska's vast unspoiled wilderness areas support abundant wildlife populations. Here, as in few places in North America, the wide open areas and abundant food sources maintain fully functioning ecosystems. It's a place where top predators still roam, where there are orca, wolves, owls, and bears. Brown bears have lived in Alaska for over 10,000 years. Despite their fearsome reputation, brown bears, or grizzlies as they're sometimes called, are sensitive and intelligent animals that form rich and intricate social systems. What's more, they've developed sophisticated ways of communicating with each other. From the gentle interactions between a mother and her cubs to the confrontation between two adults vying for a fishing spot, bears communicate their intentions in subtle and not so subtle ways. While such aggressive physical behavior plays a key role in the brown bear's social order, most bear communication is far less intense. Still, most people think of bears as overly aggressive and anything but predictable. In Alaska, brown bears are frequently shot and killed by people who, when frightened by a bear, mistakenly interpret the animal's intentions. This is called a hop charge. It's a threatening move, but not one that usually leads to further aggressive behavior. It's when people misunderstand confrontations like this that bears are shot and killed. Understanding how bears communicate is essential for protecting both people and bears and may ultimately help us coexist with these magnificent animals. This is Motley. Named by a biologist, he is one of over a hundred brown bears that frequent the McNeil River State Game Sanctuary in southwest Alaska. Since 1970, scientists have been observing the bears and studying their behavior. First seen as a cub, Motley is now seven and behaves much like all brown bears. Soon, Motley will be looking for a female to mate with. For now, he's heading toward the river. The salmon are running, and Motley has come to fish.
This is the McNeil River Falls. Each summer, up to 70 bears gather here at one time to fish for chum salmon. From females with cubs to the largest and oldest males, the bears come to feed and gain enough nourishment to last them through the long Alaskan winter. The high concentration of bears at the falls makes it an ideal place to view their interactions. Here, a young female named Jennifer is asserting her dominance over Motley. Both bears are part of a hierarchy, a rich and complex social order that includes all of the bears here. Understanding this hierarchy is the key to unlocking many of the mysteries of why bears behave the way they do. It all begins when the bears are still young. Born in the den in midwinter, these cubs are experiencing their first summer. They're called cubs of the year, or spring cubs. Mothers and cubs form tight family units, while male bears are largely solitary. In June, the cubs are starting to learn many of the skills they'll need as they grow older. Fishing is an important skill. While most spring cubs don't actively fish, they gain other social knowledge and skills that will help them survive in the years ahead. Cubs usually stay with their mothers for two or three years. During this time, she is extremely protective of them. Other bears, both male and female, pose a serious threat to the cubs and may even attack them. As many as half of all cubs die before they're three, sometimes by falling or drowning. It's often a stressful time for the mother. To gain a better sense of the world around them, bears frequently stand up to look and sniff. Females with cubs are particularly alert, especially near salmon-rich rivers, where there are often other bears. A female sensing danger may show her concern by making these popping sounds. The sound may help alert the cubs of the female's heightened stress level. If she's not fully attentive to her cubs and they don't stay close to her, the outcome could be tragic. This is the McNeil River in 1991, a year when few salmon returned to the river. Fewer fish resulted in more competition and aggression between the bears. This is Molly. Her spring cubs are about six months old. A few seconds after these images were taken, she moved to a fishing spot on the river. But a male frightened her cubs, who were then separated from her. The spooked cubs quickly attracted the attention of two nearby males, who pursued and attacked them, leaving Molly in a desperate and futile search for her lost cubs. She chases a male that just killed one of her cubs. The other cub is still near the river.
Though shocking to witness, these events help illustrate why females like Molly are so protective of their cubs and why they're potentially dangerous to both humans and other bears when they perceive a threat. It's an early July morning, with no other bears nearby. White, a 26-year-old female, and her yearling cubs feed quietly on sedge near the mouth of the McNeil River. The sedge is rich in protein and will supplement their summer diet of fish. By mid-morning, White's cubs are hungry for more than sedge. Females nurse their cubs for about two and a half years, or until the cubs are ready to live on their own. While nursing, cubs often make this purring sound. When they're finished nursing, cubs often play together. It's through play like this that cubs learn to communicate with other bears. The play postures they use now will be used throughout their adult lives. Even when there is just one cub, play continues. Mothers and cubs stay together for as long as three years, but most split up when the cubs are about two and a half. That's when the mother typically becomes fertile again. During this time, she grows increasingly intolerant of her cubs and pushes them out on their own. After leaving their mothers, the young bears continue their play sessions. These bears are four and a half years old. They play together until noticing an older male walking toward the river. Wary of his size, the younger bears retreat. Bears are almost always on the move, searching for food or staying out of each other's way. Once they've reached a safe distance, the bears resume playing. Bears usually play with others of approximately the same age and size, and usually the same sex, but not always. Here, seven-year-old Motley is playing with a four-year-old female named Carmela. Even when bears become mature and weigh over a thousand pounds, they continue to play, but not as often as when they were young. Very old bears almost never play. Playing with another bear, this time a male of his own age named Crew, Motley becomes more aggressive. A female in heat is nearby. Their play quickly turns into a fight.
A far more common sight this time of year is a male searching for females in estrus. It's early June, and Motley is sniffing the spot where a female bear has been resting. Through his incredible sense of smell, he can quickly sense her reproductive condition. Males tend to stay close to females in estrus, unless driven off by a more dominant bear. Following a young female, Motley attempts to mate, but she's not at the peak of her estrus cycle and is not entirely receptive to his advances. Most mating takes place in May and June. During this time, large males are so persistent at following females that they seldom take time to feed or rest. The female dictates when she and the male will breed. The male follows her until she's ready, sometimes for days. Actual mating may last more than 45 minutes. As mating season passes, females with cubs appear more frequently at the river. With fewer aggressive males nearby, it's a safer place for the cubs. This is an excellent time to observe the bear. Vocalizing, like these cubs calling out, is one of the ways bears communicate. Bears also communicate by touching, smelling, watching, and through body posture. These cues are just as important as sound. As two young males meet, they greet one another by mouthing each other on the head and neck. Perhaps the most common display seen among bears involves facing and looking toward another bear. Here, a mature female waits for a large male to leave a preferred fishing spot. When the male moves toward the female, she backs off and maintains her distance. Both approaching or retreating have communication value. When bears sit or lie down in the presence of other bears, they're expressing their reluctance to engage in more intense interactions. Communication between bears that are fishing is often subtle. With limited room available at many fishing holes, bears of similar rank commonly take turns fishing. Lying down and waiting signals a tolerance for the other bear to finish. These bears may share this sight as long as they're hungry. Bears of similar rank often perform a medium intensity display called jawing. Jawing is sometimes a prelude to physical contact, but more often it serves to diffuse contact. 
vocalizations and head movements are always part of the display. Jawing can turn into a more threatening behavior. Sometimes competition for food, mates, space, or social rank leads to contact. However, if the bears have battled before, the fight is usually brief. With the fight over, Motley straddles, urinates, and rubs against bushes and other vegetation. Scientists aren't exactly sure why bears do this. It may be redirected aggression, a result of stress associated with fighting. Rubbing and urinating is almost certainly related to scent communication. These behaviors may also help relieve the stress associated with fighting. Because fights between bears can be dangerous, they have evolved highly ritualized displays to minimize physical injury. A stiff-legged gait or strut called cowboy walking is typical of such displays. Cowboy walking is usually directed toward other males or performed over places where fertile females have recently been. It has also been directed toward humans. Rubbing against vegetation is often part of the ritual. These two mature males are engaging in cowboy walking. As they circle each other, they move purposefully, slowly, and deliberately. This display is almost always accompanied by urination. Head and body orientation are important in signaling a bear's intentions. When a bear stands with its side facing the other bear, it's conveying an unwillingness to attack. A bear with a lowered head may be highly aroused and ready for contact. When Joe, the light-colored bear, approaches another bear named Scraper, he's forced back. Scraper, a more aggressive bear, asserts his dominance by first defensively crouching, then directly approaching and threatening Joe. The two do not engage in cowboy walking, but the orientation of the head and body is still important, as both bears alternately face, then look away from each other possibly signaling a reluctance to pursue a fight. Joe, the light-colored bear, has his ears back against his head, a behavior typical of submissive and defensive bears. After one of these confrontations, a large male will sometimes stand and rub against a bush. At McNeil Falls, rubbing is almost exclusively performed by dominant bears, like this bear, one of the largest males at the river. By using sound, smell, posturing, and body contact to communicate, bears have evolved a social system that establishes a hierarchy which allows them to coexist with one another. Woofy, the darkest bear, is at the top of the McNeil River hierarchy. He's known as the Alpha Bear, and he's exceptionally aggressive. He's quick to assert his dominance over a subordinate male. On his way to the river, he will force any bear in his path to move. His social position becomes apparent as he enters the river.
Here, Woofy forces another bear out of a prime fishing spot. With merely a threatening gesture and vocalization, a potentially damaging conflict is avoided. Fights between male bears sometimes result in injury. Fortunately, bears are resilient and the injuries heal quickly, leaving visible scars. Over time, the males learn how to coexist with each other. As summer progresses, the hierarchy is more clearly established. Both the frequency and intensity of fighting decreases. When a large male approaches these sub-adult bears, they move away to maintain a safe distance. Sub-adults are at the bottom of the social order and are constantly on the lookout for more dominant bears. Female bears, like white, are more tolerant of each other. Still, older females tend to dominate younger ones. Competing for the best fishing position, two young females of similar rank jaw at each other, much the way older females do. Unlike the males, females seldom come in physical contact with each other. Mothers with cubs commonly buy for fishing spots by forcing other bears to move out of their way. Mothers tolerate other families, but only at a distance. Motley ranks in the middle of the McNeil River hierarchy. Here he loses a fish to an older, larger, and more aggressive bear. Living within the boundaries of this hierarchy, bears, both young and old, benefit greatly. The hierarchy reduces aggression among the bears and gives them more time for other activities, such as playing, fishing, and resting. Understanding how bears communicate with each other can be useful since bears react to people much as they respond to other bears. With enough exposure to people, bears grow accustomed to their presence. This gives both sides an advantage. Encounters need not end in conflict. At McNeil River, a mutual understanding between bears and people has evolved that allows for interactions previously considered impossible. By acting in ways that don't surprise bears, trust emerges on both sides, allowing visitors to the falls a chance to observe and appreciate the bears. Still, visitors must pay close attention and keep their distance. Fosse and her two cubs are approaching a group of hikers. Rather than surprise or frighten her, the hikers calmly signal their presence. Making sounds while the bear is still at a safe distance can be the key to avoiding a confrontation. Here, a young bear approaches a group of people near the mouth of the river. They move out of his way to allow him to pass. By moving back, they signal a reluctance for confrontation. In turn, the bear gives no sign of aggression. He simply approaches and then passes by.
For too long, the relationship between people and bears has been adversarial, founded on our fear and misunderstanding. As we uncover the subtle interactions upon which bear society is built, we are beginning to appreciate bears as individuals, to admire and respect them, not simply for their strength and power, but for their sensitivity and intelligence, and for the richness of their lives. And perhaps, as we learn more about bears, our understanding will lead to increased protection that will help to ensure their long-term survival.
also available from Sky River Film.